All right. Well, thanks a lot, George. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, George said it. Uh, my name is Kevin Testo. I'm with the Bonadio Group. Uh, we're a firm uh, that has offices all the way from New York City to Buffalo. Uh, we're, we're the largest independent um, uh, accounting firm here in New York State. Um, so, as George mentioned, I work with a lot of nonprofits, but specifically schools. Um, we have dozens of independent schools like yourselves. So we're very accustomed to the audit requirements of, of, of independent schools. And along with that goes the 990 preparation, your, your favorite document, right? Um, so I appreciate everyone joining in. Um, we've we did this presentation uh, about a month ago to some of our clients here in, in um, the Albany area. And it took about an hour. There's about 40 minutes worth of material, but a lot of questions come up and that's what uh, I'm hoping does. Uh, and you know, we will end promptly at five. <laughs> we won't go over, but I, I am happy to stay on for as long as you want. For those of you who didn't get their questions answered, feel free to stick around and, and I can stick around as well. So I just wanted to point that out. So I'm going to share my slides now. Um, I'm just going to share the screen along with that. And here we go. I'm hoping you see my um, slide deck. Do you see that? Perfect. Is it good? Okay, great. Um, so let's just get right into it. What's, what the purpose of today is, is to give you a little bit of introduction on what the 990 is all about. Um, I'm not sure if there's finance folks um, or board members on, on this. Um, I know originally there was a mix. Um, so bear with me if some of you are on the management side and bear with me if, 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 if you're uh, a board member, I, but I do think it's equally um, important for you to really understand what's in the 990. We'll talk about the, um, an overview of the required schedules. Um, so you have an idea of what's actually in it. We'll talk briefly about unrelated business income, which is a hot topic these days. We could have a whole hour discussion of UBI, but we thought we would touch a, bit, a little bit on that. And then uh, avoiding the common mistakes um, of what we've been seeing personally when we're helping our clients prepare the 990s. And then I'll give you a little top 10 areas of focus. Um, at the end, um, there's a slide that next time you look at a 990, <laughs> bring this slide out and say, have I touched these top 10 areas? Am I comfortable with these top 10 areas? So that's a, your little gift and, and takeaway uh, at the end of the session. So if that sounds good, um, I, it's, it's hard to kind of take a vote, but I'm curious how many of you actually look at the 990 on an annual basis before it goes out the door? I saw one hand. Okay. Well, there's two. Okay. <laughs> Some of you are on mute. So, so that's okay. I guess this is the first topic that I wanted to, to address uh, with you all. So the first slide here, what is the 990? In my mind, it's, it's really that universal document that binds all nonprofits together. Um, there's a new accounting standard coming down the pike, uh, which I'll do a little plug. I'm doing a webinar next week on that. And that's going to bind all nonprofits together, depending on what kind of nonprofit you are. But obviously you could be an independent school, you can be a hospital, you could be a nursing home, you could be a college. They're all different type of nonprofits, but the similar item that they all produce is a 990. It's not a tax return, although it's filed with the IRS. I, I don't like to call it a tax return because it's really giving the reader information about your organization that they couldn't get from your audited financial statements. Yes, there is some financial information included in there, but it's really about what other things, and we'll talk about those things, uh, what are they meaning to your organization for, throughout the year? So it's really a way for the IRS to ensure compliance, both with your tax exempt status, which you all have, and the fact that the IRS views these as 
if they're not accurate, they're not done timely. And that's a key, key thing to remember because this is where you as management or a board member have a responsibility to ensure that the information in here is accurate and complete. So that's really important. And we talk about always filing timely. Yes, it's important to meet the deadline, which I'm assuming a lot of you are June 30th year end. Most independent schools are. Um, so you have until May 15th to finalize your June 30th 990. So almost a whole year. Um, you definitely want to meet that um, um, because there's significant penalties for those of you who don't meet that deadline. But even more, if there are three consecutive years where the 990 isn't filed on time or inaccurately, an organization can really um, lose their tax exempt status. This is a big, um, uh, obviously, penalty, the worst penalty that the IRS could grant. Uh, and we have seen this happen. So it is important, um, but ultimately it's, it's, it's really there for transparency. It's really there for the organization from abusing its tax exempt status that was set up years ago uh, by the IRS. So I asked how many, how many of you folks really look at, at the, the 990 before it's filed? Few of you have, few of you may not. So, did you know that there is a question on the 990 that asks, have the board members been provided with a full copy of the return prior to being filed with the IRS? Right. A lot of you may look at this in different ways and, and, and be concerned with, oh boy, I don't have time for the board to vote on the 990, there's not a board meeting before the deadline. That's okay. It clearly says, <laughs> it doesn't say it clearly, but the best practice that we see is that board members at least have the opportunity to review and comment on it before it's filed in case it's not accurate, it's not complete. Most of my clients have a finance or an audit committee that looks at it in detail, approves it, and then sends it to the board for review. That's a perfectly acceptable uh, process, but you need to make sure that happens because that's ultimately the board's fiduciary duty uh, to look at that. And you wanna make sure that question is accurately answered as yes. So the other thing, a little misconception is that, well, my CPA firm prepares it so I don't need to look at it. That's not the best answer because I have to say, the 990 is not audited. Unlike your financial statements, which are audited, there are certain items on the 990 that we as auditors don't really look at as part of the audit. Such as, we'll talk about those areas, but you know, compensation from, by, uh, by your key employees. Those are areas where, yes, I would like to look at a W-2 to make sure that it's accurate, but what about the benefits that you are paid to your key employees? We're really relying on management and the board to ensure that that, that information is accurate and complete. So that's just one good, good answer or, or thing to remember that don't always rely on the CPA and the audited financial statements to, to, to make sure that this is correct. We are actually relying on you, the board members, uh, to do this. Yes, it's, it's quite possible that your auditor will help you through it and make sure that there's nothing missing. That would be a great audit firm, but we're not issuing an opinion on that. So back to the process about the board members, you know, are they provided a full copy of the return prior to filing? So I mentioned the audit committee and the finance committee approving, and that's a, that's a perfectly fine process. You have the ability to write in and schedule O, which we'll talk about, what your process is. So there should be no um, question on what that organization's process is because it will be described. And the more you describe, the, the less red flags that the IRS and the outside uh, public will have. 
Any questions so far? I right, will stop because this is a hot topic. Okay. All right, I haven't heard any, so that's and George is monitoring the questions if you don't want to type in. Okay, so another big piece of the 990 is is it talks about compliance policies. There's a big uh, there's about ten questions on the 990. That talks about conflicts of interest, whistleblower policies, document retention policies, and all that good stuff. And this really stemmed from the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that went into effect after the, the big Enron scares of 2002, 2003. And the IRS, shortly after that, revamped the 990. And when they did that, they added about 30 pages to the Form 990 to keep accountants uh, keep, keep us busy. Um, but it was also a st uh, stemming from those type of questions that are, are compliance policies that are required for public um, um, organizations. You may have heard of the Nonprofit Revitalization Act, which was enacted probably now about six or so years ago by New York State. So the Charities Bureau of New York State enacted this which really was in line with Sarbanes-Oxley and the compliance policies outlined in the 990. Um, we could do a whole another seminar on that. However, um, if you haven't heard much about that, I would ask your, your, your current audit firm or your CPA, because this affects most uh, organizations, almost all nonprofits in New York State. There's only been a few exceptions. So part of that, uh, has to do with conflicts of interest. What is the organization doing to monitor conflicts of interest? Um, it's okay to have conflicts of interest, and I mean those those folks who may be on a board and you work for, say, an insurance company where your school does business with. That is a conflict of interest, but you can still have that transaction as long as that person steps aside um, when a vote is being made. So the 990 asks if the organization has a conflict of interest policy that would address such that. It describes a process for monitoring this type of policy. You know, is it your policy as a, as a board member to fill out an annual conflict of interest? And what happens when those are all taken up by the board chair? Are those conflicts made public to the rest of the board? That's a best practice to get into if that's not happening. Because how you how, how do you do you as a board member know that there's any other type of conflicts? So the IRS obviously is very interested in these type of conflicts of interest. If there's a, a head of school who works um, and has a a voting um, interest or, or voting right. That's perfectly okay, but they should not be considered independent um, as a board member. So those things have to be addressed. Those things have, have to be written. And again, <laughs> Schedule O gives you all the room that you want to document any type of policies that, that you have. Especially if you, you, you mark these as no, um, you know, maybe a lot of uh, organizations don't have a document retention and destruction policy. It seems a little bit, I don't know, a little bit too secure, I would say, for a nonprofit. Again, this came from the Sarbanes-Oxley rules. However, it's okay to document no, but you should document why in your intention should we have one or in, and why you don't have one. Whistleblower policies, we've been seeing more and more um, which are very important to nonprofit organizations. A little fact I'll give you is that, you know, we hear about fraud and fraud is everywhere, unfortunately. Only 3% of frauds are actually detected by your external audit. Where do you think most of them come from? Well, internally. Internal whistleblower policies are those um, that really are detecting uh, any type of frauds within an organization. So again, little side note, it's important that you have one, but it is important to the 990 because anything that's always checked no isn't going to promote an IRS audit, but it is somewhat of a red flag, both to the IRS 
and the outside viewer of the 990. Also, do you have gift acceptance policies? Uh, those were those. Are, that's another question on the 990. Um, and if you don't, could you document why? And that's really the best practice. So any, any questions so far? The next slide, we're gonna just talk a little bit about what's in the 990, very briefly, but really what's in it. But I'll stop, anyone has questions on what I already shared. Okay. Jeff asked a great question about um, independent directors. Um, I don't know if this, uh, Jeff, you wanna state that yourself or if you'd like me to uh, restate um, your question. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I'm just wondering, there's it's a question every year whether current parents on the board are considered independent directors because they have this tuition relationship with the school. Um, not sure if that's a business relationship or not. Yep. Great question. And yes, they would be um, independent. They are not, and this is a question that comes up on all of my schools, and consistency is key. <laughs> um, this happens a lot, and the answer is yes, they are independent. They're not getting paid. Yes, they are. They do have some type of interest because they're getting maybe tuition reduction. Um, however, they are independent, and I would recommend putting it in Schedule O, the basis for that, which would be the fact that, yes, they, they are independent because of the compensation is not being given. They're not an employee of the school. Good question. I knew that was going to come up because that's a very popular question. Okay. All right. Interrupt me at any time. So let's just go through briefly for those of you who haven't been too ingrained into the 990. This is a quick checklist of what is part of the core form which the core form is really only 12 pages. It's all the additional schedules that you attach to the back that make the 990 go from 12 pages to 46 pages. So we'll talk about that. Not all schedules are required, um, but you should know, have, have a, a good idea of what would be required if needed. So page one. Page one is the summary of the entire form. You can get a lot of information from page one, um, a lot of folks may just look at page one, um, but what that gives is a summary of your financial information, assets, liabilities, revenue, and expenses. It gives a summary of your mission. It gives a summary of your year end. It gives a summary of who your auditor is, and it gives your summary of the, the, the key uh, board members, the number of board members, and the number of volunteers that you have. So there's a lot of good information, but it's all stemmed from the back schedules that we'll talk about. Page two gives some more information about the mission of your organization. Um, and this can come right from typically note one or note two of your audited financial statements, which often says the same thing. And more importantly, your program service accomplishments. They wanna know your top three programs that you run. For independent schools, it could be your, um, your day program. It could be a summer program, and perhaps it's some type of after school care. Those could be your top three revenue generating programs. And the IRS wants to know what those are all about and the, and the revenue and expenses that are associated with those top three programs. It's okay if you only have one program, it's okay if you have two programs. It's okay if you have six, but they only wanna know about the top three. So that's all summarized on page two. Now pages three and pages four go into what are the required checklists that you should add. I mentioned that's all gonna be after page 12. And we'll go through those required work schedules, I should say. But those really need to be read both by management and by the board because 
things could change from year to year that require additional schedules. Those yes, no type of questions shouldn't be the same as last year, or you shouldn't just default to the same as last year because you may have a fundraising event that you didn't have last year, and now you do, and now Schedule G would be required to be included on your night or night. And that's just one example. I heard some feedback, so maybe someone has a question. So page six outlines your governance, who your board is, the policies for reviewing, which we just talked about, how many voting members that you have versus how many board members you have. It's quite possible that those numbers may not be exact. Um, you could have board members that don't vote or board members that aren't independent. So those numbers don't always have to match. So it's important to look at those. But all of your, your, um, your board members, as of the end of the year, are all listed there. A question often comes up, well, what if I had somebody who was on it for one month during the year and they're not on it as of the end of the year? Best practice is to include them. Uh, it doesn't hurt. Um, you may show 15 board members and then show the number at the end of the year to be 12. That's okay because the number is as of the end of the year who you list in the schedule is anyone who was a member during the year. At the bottom of that list, which often uh, goes on to pages seven and eight, you have to um, include your top officers. The question always comes up is who is an officer? And yes, it's your board chair, your VP, the secretary and treasurer. So those four are officers. But the IRS also defines officers as your CEO and your CFO. Doesn't necessarily have to have that title. As you know, most of your CEOs are called a head of school. Most of your CFOs could be called director of finance. Perhaps you only have a controller at your school, but if they're the top key finance person, then they should be considered a, uh, um, an officer. And for all those officers, your compensation has to be uh, detailed which includes your W-2 wages and your benefits that you paid to those officers. And we'll talk about that in a minute because that's a common, common mistake that we see. And finally, what type of independent contractors do you work with? You do not have to have them all listed, but the IRS requires anyone who pays more than 100, who you pay more than $100,000 to, uh, to be listed on pages eight, pages seven and eight. Finally, pages nine through 11 is a recap of your financial statements, statement of revenue, statement of expenses, and then your balance sheet. This should match your audited financial statements perfectly, right? Well, the answer is no. The IRS makes nothing simple. Um, the, one of the key differences, or two key differences I'll give you, unrealized gains and losses on investments, those are not included on the statement of revenue. Those are going to, going to be considered a reconciling item because the IRS only cares about those type of cash revenue, cash expenses. Unrealized gains losses is just a paper gain expense. So we carve that out. The other reconciling item that we often see is uh, your financial aid which on the financial statements is often netted against the revenue, tuition revenue. So you often see only one number, but on the 990, you need to break that out separately. Financial aid is considered an expense in the 990 world and would show up on your functional expenses under line two under scholarships. So just important to know that because if you're looking at your statement of revenue, and your statement of expenses and trying to compare that <laughs> to your audited financial statements, they're often not going to match up. And there's, there's room, as we'll speak about, to show where that reconciliations, uh, what those reconciling items are. And then finally, page 12 
gives those the reconciliation of net assets, which we just talked about. There's a little snippet about there, those items that are reconciling. But then more importantly, gives the reader some information on were your financial statements audited and who was responsible for those that audit. The audit committee, the board of directors, or some type of body internally should be meeting with your auditor to discuss the audit. And that process should be checked as yes, hopefully, uh, and documented in Schedule O of what that process is. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on and then I'll open it up to questions. So I mentioned those, that's the core of the 990, those first 12 pages. This is a very brief overview of the supplemental schedules that are possible to be included in your 990. I'm not gonna cover them all because they're all not going to apply to you, but know when you're going through those yes, no questions, this is what they're asking. Should we include Schedule A? Should we include Schedule B? And on and on and on. So to have an understanding of what's in those schedules, I think is key. So next time you go through those questions, you can say, okay, yeah, this does apply. We need to make sure that that schedule's attached. So the first one, Schedule A, is, is a must. It's a requirement. It's a requirement for all nonprofits because it details to the reader what your public charity status is. And when you go to Schedule A, it's going to list probably 12 different options. And you as an independent school have this the easiest, you have the easiest out here. <laughs> because line two should say a school, an independent nonprofit school. And the, and the best answer, and the, the, the reason why this is very good is because you don't have to fill out the rest of Schedule A. <laughs> All other nonprofits do, and they have to show why they are considered a public status. So as long as your IRS determination letter states the type of nonprofit you are, and that you are a school, box two should be checked and nothing else needs to be done on Schedule A. So it's as easy as that. Now Schedule B, Schedule of Contributions, um, details out the contributors. Who gave you money that's typically greater than $5,000? That's the threshold that I always go with. Um, and we need to know the name of the donor and the address. And the idea there is that the IRS should be able to match up someone's personal tax returns with the 990 descriptions in Schedule B. If they do that, I don't know, but that's why they hire accountants to preach that message. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm doing right now. Schedule C, I don't see a lot of lobbying activities in, uh, at independent schools. If you have them, if you use a lobbyist, I would recommend going and looking at the instructions for Schedule C, but I'm gonna skip over it for now because I don't see it often for schools. Um, but no, if you are doing any type of lobbying, you need to think about Schedule C. Schedule D, Supplemental Financial Statements, is good because it gives a lot of more, more detail other than the Statement of Revenue, Statement of Expenses that we talked about. It can give you detail on your property and equipment uh, or breakdown of whatever you have included in other assets or other liabilities. Often that's a very vague statement. So it gives the reader some opportunity to know what's in those. But more importantly, and this is where for independent schools, Schedule D gives you the option to detail out your endowments. Most of you probably have endowments and it asks for a roll forward from beginning of the year to the end of the year and the activity in between, um, which often will come from your financial statements, uh, but you need to be sure that's filled out correctly. And then more importantly, it's gonna ask for the percentages at the end of the year of what's in that endowment broken out by the restrictions on net assets. I'm sure you're all familiar with permanently restricted, temporarily restricted, and then board endowed or board designated endowments. So it's gonna ask you for the percentage at the end of the year of those three. So now that we're all comfortable with that, next week's uh, webinar about the new ASU is going to tell you that those three buckets are going away. <laughs> so well, it's, it'll be interesting to see how the 990 conforms to that. But anyway, uh, that's what's in Schedule D. 
Schedule E, schools. This is key for you. If you're not a school, you don't need to worry about Schedule E. But this is a one-page schedule that talks about do you, or asks, do you have a non-discriminatory non policy? And how is that made available to both your employees and your students? So that's really just a compliance yes and no question, but you wanna make sure that is, is, is filled out uh, accurately. Schedule F, the IRS wants to know if you're doing any activities outside of the United States. And this does not just include bank accounts. Often what we're seeing in, with independent schools is that their investment portfolio invests in funds that could be an LLC that is incorporated in the Cayman Islands or some Bermuda or Bahamas Islands. This is important to know because this would be required to be reported on Schedule F. So think about that next time you're looking at Schedule F and say, hmm, what's in my investment portfolio here at the school? And are we sure none of them are incorporated elsewhere? Schedule G, I talked about, if you're doing any type of fundraising, you need to show this on Schedule G. And it requires the top two in terms of revenue uh, fundraising events that you had. As long as they're greater than $15,000 of revenue, each one, uh, they are required to be on Schedule G. Titling whatever it is, golf outing, annual gala, whatever, and showing the expenses that are, are, are going against the revenue that was earned at these fundraising events. It's quite possible they were none last year, but that's okay, you would add that this year. Obviously, we're gonna skip over Schedule H. Schedule I talks about grants and other assistance, and this is where your financial aid comes into play. The IRS wants to know how many students you're giving financial aid to. And this is pretty simple. It's just the dollar amount and the number of students that are receiving it. Compensation on Schedule J is key. This really goes down to the wages, and the benefits that are paid to your key employees that we talked about before. This would include the base salary, of course, that comes from the W-2, but contributions to a 401k plan, contributions to uh, a health insurance plan, um, perhaps a membership dues that are paid uh, for some type of gym or outside uh, networking club. Think about everything that's paid to your head of school, your CFO, and if that plus a W-2 is greater than $150,000, then Schedule J would be required. So total compensation, wages and benefits. Schedule K is required uh, if you have tax-exempt bonds that are greater than $100,000 at the end of the year. Um, there's some information that's needed for the issuer, who the issuer was, the proceeds, why they were used. Um, not overly complex, but if you think, if you have a tax exempt bond on your books, think Schedule K. Schedule L, transactions with interested persons. Typically what we see here is if a board member loans money to the school, not a contribution, but loans and expects to be paid back that would be a transaction that you would want to record on Schedule L. So think about your board members, uh, what type of business you may be doing with your board members. The example I gave before, if you're doing business with a board member and that board member is the CEO of an insurance company, that should be recorded on Schedule L. Schedule M, Non-cash contributions, the IRS wants to know what you're receiving in, in lieu of cash. The most common item that we see is investments. Sometimes someone may donate a car or a boat or something, um, but really it's investments, stocks. And the IRS just wants to know what type of investment was given, what was the market value at the date of uh, contribution. Pretty easy. But just think, you know, if you're working with your development department, you may want to remember, okay, I don't want to just know the cash, but what type of contributions were given uh, elsewhere as well. Schedule N, we'll talk about 
we are, I'm sorry, we won't talk about. Uh, many of you aren't in liquidation or you probably wouldn't be on this call. Schedule O, supplemental information. This is the area where you can write whatever you want. <laughs> so all those answers, those yes, no questions, if you wanna add more color to the yeses or describe why something is, is marked as no, Schedule O gives you the luxury to do that. And finally, Schedule R, related organizations. If you have maybe a foundation that is related to your school and a completely different EIN number, that's the key, then you would want to write who, who that related organization is, include the address and the EIN number. And it's just going to ask you what type of transactions that you had amongst your related organization. Not a big deal. Um, but think about it, if you have some other organization that may not be audited, uh, you're going to want to report that in Schedule R. So that's it. There could be no other schedules, um, but I would go through these next time you're looking at the yes, no questions to see if any of them may apply. So I'll stop there, see if anyone has any questions. We had one question, Kevin. Um, Alvina, I can ask it for you. Um, the, unless you'd like to ask it yourself. No, go ahead. You could ask. You could ask it. Because uh, I wasn't sure your microphone. Oh, you, yeah, you I just got it back. Mic was working. Go ahead. Okay, I was just wondering um, about NICE's organization um, in terms of lobbying, whether or not they have to be um, on the um, 990. So, in your case you hire NYSEs, is that correct, to do yeah. lobbying for you? Yes. Well, okay. not, not exactly. So we, so as a, I think, and I, Member you know, schools. If I'm wrong, they're, they don't hire NYSEs so much as they're members of. So members of the organization. Of association right. that does do lobbying efforts, do you as right. a convention, as a nonprofit, have that affect the 990 in any way? Great. Great question. And I would answer that as no, because okay. You're a member, and with that comes other benefits. Okay. Nice A's, because we also prepare nice A's as 990, would re be required to say that they are doing lobbying as well. Okay. So not you as a member of the association. Okay. I had another question in terms of the um, non-cash contributions. I'm thinking about auction items. Like, is there a monetary amount over, you know, $5,000 gets listed or that would go under a certain, you know, under the, uh, uh, the event itself? How does that work? So you're talking about items that are donated per se Correct. to the auction off at a fundraising event? Correct. Mm, that's a great question because typically, I'm not sure if you're in the finance realm or board, but. Typically, you're not going to record them as contribution revenue right. on your financial statements, which is then going to trigger your 990. Anything that's 5% would be generated from the contribution revenue <laughs> from your financial statements. Okay. So the fact that that isn't part of your financial information, I would say it's not going to ever show up on your Schedule B. Okay. $5,000 or more of contributions, which in turn wouldn't show up as non-cash on Schedule M as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I know, that's like a cause and effect type of question. <laughs> so. All right, I'll move on just for the interest of time. Like I said, I'll, I'll hang out if anyone has other questions. So I really wanna talk about unrelated business income because this is probably the grayest area in the history of the 990 or it could be the history of the IRS. So, so here's my two cents on it. We could talk a lot about it, but I'm gonna focus on the three elements of what is considered UBI or unrelated business income. The three elements according to the 990 is that the activity is a trade or a business, meaning you're producing income from a sale of good or services. The activity is regularly carried on and the activity is not substantially related to the organization's exempt purpose. So as you can see, there's a lot of gray area in there, specifically the third one. So it's funny, if you went to the instructions on the 990 
about is it UBI or not? All it really is is this, and then a bunch of different examples <laughs> of different organizations and their unrelated business income, which could be or could be not considered. So what we stress is that anytime you have a new program or your or maybe the existing programs that you have, consider at least ask these questions because it's not black and white. And, but it's not bad either. You know, often questions come up as, oh, if I have UBI, oh, I'm going to go against my organization and then they're going to revoke my, my tax exempt status. That's not the case at all. It's perfectly okay to have unrelated business income that quite possibly you could pay a little tax on, but it's, it's more important to disclose it than not disclose it. And then the IRS come in and tell you that you had it. <laughs> so I'll give you an example of a few that may may be relevant to your school. You know, a, a, a big one that often comes up is I have a gift shop or a, a bookstore per se on my campus, and that bookstore sells books, it sells um, drinks, food, but really you have that for the benefit of your students. And the big example is the school is not out there promoting the bookstore to the general public, right? If I'm hungry, I'm not going to think to go to the campus of my private school that's nearby to go and get a snack, right? The average person wouldn't do that. So what I tell my clients is that's not UBI. It's in line with your mission to promote the education of women. It's, it's furthering them along uh, and helping their path uh, to promote your mission. So that's just one example, but to me, that's not something that, that, that's common that wouldn't be considered UBI. Another example I have is a nonprofit has a parking lot. Every year, there's a huge concert that happens across the street, which is another separate for-profit company. But that nonprofit allows, it charges parking for that concert that happens every year, a Christmas concert that happens every year. And they get $20 a car. This happens every year. And again, this could be, it's not black and white, but to me, I've seen this happen where the IRS has said, because this happens every year, you're dealing with a for-profit company where they could find parking elsewhere, this would be considered UBI. So you would put it, because it's regularly carried on, it's not something you did once and then you were done with it. So in that case, you would report the revenue and then there's probably expense of keeping that parking lot up and whatnot and it might come down to a net effect of zero and, and there's also standard deduction and whatever. And that company or organization may not have to pay any tax on it, but it's at least reported as UBI on the back of the 990. The final example I'll give is had nothing to do with a, a school, but you know, I have a few museum clients and they have bookstores. Okay. I have a bookstore um, or a museum that uh, is, is a fine art museum. If they were selling books and whatnot on Monet and Da Vinci and whatnot, to me, that would not be considered UBI. But if they turned around and started selling books on you know, science or education of something that had nothing to do with art, then I would caution them to say, rethink that and think about, does it go into these three elements of UBI? Probably not substantially related to the organization's exempt purpose of running an art museum. So there's a lot of stuff to, to, to think about and, and maybe we should consider doing another webinar on UBI. But at this point, I just wanted to throw it out there um, and, and just you know think about it. Think about it next time you're looking at the 990. You know your schools better than me. And if there's new programs that come around or examining the programs is, is probably key. Okay. So avoiding, now that we know all about 
those schedules, here are the common mistakes that we typically see. And I'll go through these fairly briefly because we talked about a lot about it. Page one, failure to check the box on the top left which indicates if this is your initial return, which is your first 990 that you would ever file, or a final return, terminated, meaning you're, you're, you're liquidated. Most of you probably aren't, aren't in that uh, standpoint now. Um, but reporting on the full mission of your organization should be on line one, which continues over to page two, as we discussed. Not identifying that board member who is not an independent member of your organization, we talked about that. The head of school may have a voting right, but the head of school is not independent. So that should be indicated as such when it's asking for the numbers of who's on the board and the number of who's independent. Typically, we don't see a lot of volunteers uh, being listed for board members. Most board members aren't paid and you're volunteering. Um, so to have a volunteer number of zero uh, is probably a mistake because you at least have four members of your board that should be listed as board members, or volunteers, sorry. So on page two, we talked about it, you know, making sure that all of your programs or any new programs that you start are listed on part two, because that's where it's asking you, what are your top three programs uh, that your school is operating? On pages three and pages four, making sure that all the responses are included. This is where we talk about those yes, no type of questions, compliance type of questions, which will generate the schedules in the back that we just talked about. Most of you don't have custodial funds, so we won't talk about that. But the failure to report endowment funds and the percentage of restrictions uh, as we talked about, the restrictions between those three buckets, making sure those are accurate um, and complete. Making sure that the fundraising events that you have during the year are also listed. That's a perfect example where your auditor's not gonna know that. Your auditor's probably not gonna know that you added a golf outing during the year. Only management and the board members are gonna know that. Any type of loans between the directors, key employees, as we just discussed, which would be on Schedule L, those are, you got to be sure those are listed. Again, the auditor's not going to always know that. Any type of transaction with board member organizations, family members employed by the organizations, not so much. Tuition, however, if a board member, uh, you know, had any type of loans, um, or, or major contributions, they would probably be showing up on Schedule B as well. So working with your development department is key. Page five, failure to report payments made by donors, partly as a contribution and partly for goods or services. Here's a, here's a, key, uh, a key mistake that we often see, and the IRS asks about this. Say you have, uh, uh, annual dinner as a fundraiser. The, the dollar amount to go to that dinner is $200, but the cost to you for the food and everything or to that employee, or I'm sorry, to that uh, donor is $100. Well, do you notify that donor that the tax uh, deductible amount is only $100? Because yes, you gave us 200, but it's $100 was for the food and whatnot. Do you give that to your donor? It's a yes, no question, but is development doing that? And the IRS wants to know. Reporting any changes to your government documentations, you know, were your bylaws amended? Were your voting rights amended? Now those are things, again, the auditor's not gonna know, but if, it, if there were changes, it's okay to have a yes answer to that. You should just document it. Compensation, this is a, a big area where we see a lot of problems. I mentioned before that most schools, uh, as yourselves, is probably do probably have a June 30th year end. But on page seven, compensation is supposed to be reported on a calendar year, not a fiscal year. So there's often discrepancy there. So the rules say that we or the preparer needs to look 
at the last W-2, which obviously is always on a calendar year. So that, uh, that base salary that you're reporting on page seven is gonna be on a calendar year. But when you go to schedule J, which we discussed, which breaks down all the compensation benefits, that's gonna be on a fiscal year because that has to match all your financial information that you reported up above. I know it's confusing, uh, but unfortunately only folks who have off calendar year ends have to deal with this. So just keep that in mind. Talked about fiscal year versus the, um, the um, calendar year and making sure that all compensation, not just the person's W-2 salaries and wages are included contributions to the 403b plan, contributions to someone's health plan and whatnot. Those are all benefits that have to roll into compensation. Keeping in mind, if that's over 150,000 in total, Schedule J would be required. And finally, failure to report any changes in oversight of the committee that is responsible for the audit and the review of the organization statements. Hopefully under the Nonprofit Revitalization Act, you've all established an audit committee, which has to be three independent board members. That's a requirement. So what we see a lot is that the audit committee uh, also approves the 990 and then brings it to the board for not necessarily a vote, but making it available. But if that process changed, only you would really know that as management or a board member. The auditor is not going to know that. So those are the common mistakes that we see. Those are probably, I tried to, to key in on the significant ones, um, but ultimately the number one mistake is that someone's not reviewing the 990. <laughs> so making sure that management and the board is all comfortable is probably the number one thing to remember. And I'm not gonna go through these, but this is the cheat sheet that I said. You know, take this uh, with you next time you look at a 990. And then those are real, we, we talked about everything here. Um, so high level, all right, I'm okay with the mission. I'm okay with the compensation. I'm okay that we don't have foreign investments, whatever. I would use this as a cheat sheet. And then of course, reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, I'm happy to help. Happy to help whoever at your organization. Uh, my information is here. I'm located in Albany, that's where I'm based out of, but I share half of my time during the year also in New York City, because uh, we have multiple clients there as well. 